with me in Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 1 a prescription for peace. Philippians 4 verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. I plead with Iodia and I plead with Syntyche. Agree with one another in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, my true companion, help these women, since they've contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Look at verse 4 with me. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Look at verse 7. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, Whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put them into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Amen. Let's pray and let's invite the Holy Spirit to minister. Lord, thank you for this morning and thank you for the people you love so much. And Father, while we're talking about peace, we just pray for the peace of all those that are affected by this hurricane this weekend, Lord, for everyone in its path, for those who have experienced loss of loved ones, loss of property, Lord, for those that are just uh, in, in uh, terror right now, Lord, we just ask for your peace for them, God. Lord, pray that you'd preserve life. And Lord, we pray that as we just listen to your word, we would encounter you this morning. If your heart agrees with that, we just say amen. And amen. The Bible is a book of descriptions and prescriptions. The Bible describes God. The Bible describes what God is like, what God has done, what God will yet do. The Bible describes the creation of man in the image of God. And it describes how we rebelled against God and how our relationship was broken. And then the Bible prescribes the remedy for that broken relationship through repentance and through faith in the sacrifice of God's only son, Jesus, on the cross. The Bible describes all kinds of blessings that are available to those who love God and who live by faith in Christ. And then the Bible prescribes how to obtain those blessings. One of the blessings is an otherworldly, supernatural peace. Looking at Paul's words here in Philippians 4, I find a prescription for peace, and I want to share it with you quickly this morning. A prescription for peace. First of all, let's talk about a description of God's peace. Beloved, if there is anything that the world needs today, it's peace. If there's anything that America needs right now, desperately, we need peace. This past April on World Health Day, the World Health Organization released a study on the rising prevalence of anxiety and depression. According to the study, one in four people around the world suffer from some kind of depression or anxiety. NBC News recently reported that one in six million, one, excuse me, one in six Americans take some form of antidepressant medication. That is 64 million people. And those medications account for one-third of the annual deaths from overdoses of prescription meds. In fact, the World Health Organization forecasts that within the coming dec decade, anxiety and depression will become the number one threat to public health globally. If you can imagine that. The world needs Peace. The world needs peace that isn't easily shattered by changing circumstances. The world needs abiding peace. The world needs peace that remains. 
peace that remains is precisely what Jesus possessed and precisely what Jesus promised to give to us. Jesus said, my peace, I leave with you. I don't give you peace like the world gives. My peace remains with you. You see, the peace that the world knows is contingent upon peaceful circumstances. It's contingent upon being free from threat or need or discomfort. But God's peace defies reason. God's peace is peace when there ought to be panic. God's peace is peace when we are under intense pressure. It's peace when we're in peril. It's peace when we're in pain. It's peace when someone is persecuting us. You see, that's the whole context of the letter of Philippians. Paul is writing from prison and he says, don't be anxious about anything precisely when he had a good reason to be anxious about everything. So what is this my peace that Jesus has promised us in John 14? What is this peace of God in Philippians 4? Well, for one thing, the peace of God means covenant completeness. Paul, if you remember, was a Jewish scholar. And so his idea of peace was rooted in the Hebrew word shalom. Shalom means the wholeness that comes from walking in covenant relationship with Yahweh, with God. You see, without God, all of us are incomplete. We were created by him for constant fellowship with him. We were created to derive our sense of identity, our sense of self-worth, our sense of security and purpose from our relationship with him. Have you ever seen a little duckling who has lost its mother? It panics and it peeps and it spins around in circles until it's reunited with its mother again. And that's exactly how we are without God. We panic and we peep and we pirouette. We walk through life walking in circles without him. Shalom means that my relationship with him makes me complete. Shalom means there is nothing missing and there is nothing broken. The peace of God is inner calm. There's a settled quietness in my spirit. I'm not easily agitated I'm not easily instigated or manipulated into being fearful or panicking or being angry. You see, that's precisely how the enemy operates. He wants to get us unsettled. He wants to get us riled up. He wants to get us stirred up because in our anger or in our anxiety, there's an open door for him to come in and operate. Jesus had an inner calm all the time. That's how he could sleep in the boat in the middle of a fierce storm. That's how Jesus could hold his peace when false accusations were hurled against him. The peace of God is inner confidence. Jesus was perfectly whole in his inner man. He was secure in his father's love. He was able to love himself in a healthy way and he was able to love others. Jesus was not threatened, he was not withdrawn, he was not hostile, he was not attention-seeking. Jesus was secure in his family relationships and in his friendships. He was interdependent in a healthy way and not codependent. He was secure in his earthly masculinity and he was secure in his heavenly identity. That's why he didn't have to grasp at equality with God. When the father asked the son to become a man, to lay aside all of his heavy, heavenly dignity and glory and come to earth as a servant, Jesus was able to do it precisely because he was secure. John says, in fact, it was precisely because Jesus was secure that he was able to wrap the towel around his waist and wash the disciples' feet, a job that none of them were willing to do. The peace of God is inner courage. David describes this inner courage in Psalm 112. He says, surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They have no fear of bad news. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. 
The writer of Hebrews describes this inner courage in Hebrews chapter 13 when he says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can mere men do to me? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You see, Jesus lived with that kind of inner courage. He stood before Pilate in perfect peace. Pilate said to him, do you know who I am? Do you know what I can do to you? And Jesus said, you can't do anything to me except what my father permits. Jesus was absolutely convinced that nothing could happen to him outside of his father's plan and permission. And you and I can live in that kind of peace too. We can live in the peace that absolutely nothing, absolutely no one can touch a single hair on our head outside of our Father's permission. And if God does permit it, it's for a good purpose. My peace, the peace of God, what is it? It is covenant completeness. It is shalom. It is nothing missing and nothing broken. It is inner calm, inner confidence, inner courage. I am safe. I am secure. I am valuable. I am valued and I value others. That's a description of God's peace. Now let's talk about a prescription for getting peace. How do we get this peace? Paul gives us several imperatives here, commands or prescriptions if you will. All of which together lead up to obtaining God's peace. Let's let's look at some of these prescriptions quickly. First of all, how do we get peace? Hide your life in Christ. Once again, in Philippians, we come across those words joy and rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know, these four little chapters of this letter use the word joy and rejoice more times than any other letter in the New Testament. And there's a progression in Philippians. In chapter 1, Paul says, I rejoice in the Lord, and I will continue to rejoice. In chapter 2, he says, I rejoice with you. Now you rejoice with me. In chapter 3, Paul says, now you rejoice in the Lord. It's a safeguard for you. So here's the progression. Paul says, I rejoice. And then he says, we rejoice together. And then he says, now you rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, and again I say, rejoice. What is rejoicing in the Lord? Well, it's more than just putting on a happy face or keeping a positive mental attitude. Rejoicing in the Lord is an inner celebration of him. It's an inner celebration of, of his character of his promises, of his mighty deeds. I can celebrate because he's made good promises to me and he's not a man that he should lie. He keeps his word. It's an inner celebration that's caused by his presence inside of my heart. And you see, that gives me lasting peace. Circumstances constantly change in life. But Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If the only thing that I celebrate in life is good circumstances, my celebrations will be short-lived. But if I celebrate Him, I always have a reason to celebrate. People constantly come and go in our lives, but Jesus has promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. So his presence inside of me is a constant source of joy. It just never shuts off. We've been watching Hurricane Harvey all weekend, praying for those in its path. It's heartbreaking to see loss of life, loss of property. But do you know that you don't have to go very far at all under the surface of the water to escape the fury of a hurricane? When a hurricane is approaching, aircraft carriers, destroyers, frigates, they all have to move far out of the way, but not submarines. All submarines have to do is dive. You see, the strength of even the mightiest waves dissipates very quickly under the water. There's a formula. It's about half the height of the wave down below, and the wave's energy is mostly gone. So if you have 20-foot waves, 
at just 10 feet under the surface, 96% of the wave's energy is dissipated. So all you have to do is sur to survive a 20-foot wave is to go uh, 10 feet below the surface. A at 10 feet under the surface, a 20-foot wave has the power of a 1-foot wave. Can you survive a 1-foot wave? A 60-foot wave is a killer, but just 30 feet under the surface, it has the strength of a 3-foot wave. When the Christmas tsunami happened in 2004, I read the story of an Israeli couple who were vacationing in Thailand, and they were diving off the coast of Thailand. When the tsunami passed by them under the water, they, they just felt something whoosh by. In fact, they said they did a couple somersaults. The, the woman, her, her mask, her mouthpiece came off. And so they went up to the surface to adjust their equipment, having no idea that just a mile further inland, that wave claimed the lives of over a quarter of a million people. But they were safe below the surface. In Philippians 3, Paul said, I want to be found in Christ. To the Colossians, he said, when we believe in Jesus, our life is hidden with Christ. So listen, listen, here's how this whole thing works. Rejoicing in the Lord is like being under the water in a hurricane or a tsunami. No matter how fierce the storm no matter how deadly the surge, if we are found in Christ, if we are hidden in him, if our joy is buried in him, we're barely affected. Oh, we might feel something roll on by, but all the destructive force is dissipated because we are perfectly safe, hidden below in him. A prescription for getting peace. Hide your life in Christ. A second thing I find in Paul's words, be agreeable, not stubborn. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. In the Philippian church were two women leaders, Yodia and Syntyche. Yodia means fragrant, fragrant. And syntyche means fortunate. But these two women had the misfortune of getting into some kind of disagreement and they were stinking up the whole church. More preaching than we have time for here today, but let me say even leaders, even pastors are capable of becoming immature and disagreeable. Paul gives these two sisters high commendations. He says they contended at his side. That probably means that they endured persecution side by side with him at the founding of the Philippian church. They were there since the beginning. These were not novices. They had been in the church the whole time. Paul also says they were his co-workers. That means they had some kind of ministry leadership role. Beloved, let me say it doesn't matter how long the tenure, it doesn't matter how high the position, no one in the body is immune from developing an offended spirit. And when two influential people are in a disagreement with each other, it poses a very serious risk to the whole body. I have two questions for you this morning. The first question is, are you agreeable or are you stubborn? Paul says to these two sister leaders, agree with each other in the Lord. Let your gentleness be evident to all. That word gentleness is fascinating. It's been translated a number of different ways. William Tyndale, who translated the first English Bible, translated it as softness. Let your softness be evident to all, as in being pliable. We would say today, be flexible. Let your flexibility be evident to all. Some other translations are yielding, kindness, forbearance, leniency. It involves yielding your personal rights and showing consideration to another. Another translation, this is really good, is an attitude of non-retaliation towards your persecutors. An attitude of kindness when the expected response would be retaliation. My absolute favorite translation of this word gentleness is sweet reasonableness. Let your sweet and reasonable spirit 
be evident to all. You see, when you're offended, you are precisely the opposite of that. Proverbs 18, verse 19 says, an offended brother or sister in this case is more stubborn than a fortified city. And disputes are like the barred gates of a citadel. You see, when you are offended, your heart and your mind are closed. You can't hear the appeals and the ideas and even the apologies of the other side. You're unreasonable. You can't be reasoned with and you can't reason clearly. When you're offended, you're oversensitive and highly defensive. Everything you hear sounds like it's an attack against you. When you're offended, you're territorial. You perceive everything as a threat. You're protective of your position, of your turf. When you're offended, you're stubborn. You refuse to like anything, even, when you, even though you really like it inside. You refuse to like it. <laughs> you refuse to agree. You refuse to cooperate. When you're offended, you're passive-aggressive. You might be sitting down on the inside, on the outside, but you're standing up on the inside. It's the story of a, a dad who put his little defiant daughter in the timeout chair. And after a few minutes in the timeout chair, he went over to the corner to see if she had had a change of heart. And she said to him with her arms folded and her eyes locked on the floor and her lips puckered into a pout, she said to him, I'm sitting down on the outside but I'm standing up on the inside. <laughs> That's how some of us are. When you're offended, you're combative. Everything is grounds for a fight. When you're offended, you're conspiratorial. You gather your support. This is good preaching right here, by the way. You, you, you gather your supporters around you and you draw your battle lines. That's exactly what was happening in the Philippian church. When you're offended, listen to me, when you are offended, you are spiritually dangerous. You're a potential doorway through whom the enemy can come and get a foothold and cause dissension and quarreling. When you're offended, you're immature, both in the natural sense and the spiritual sense. Paul says, agree in the Lord. Manifest gentleness, sweet reasonableness. The Lord is near. What did Jesus say to us? He said, take my yoke and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. When the father asked the son to become a man and to come lay down his life, the son did not grasp at his rights. He did not grasp at his position. He willingly laid it down. How much like the son are you? He's near to you always, and he's coming again very soon. Two questions. Number one, are you agreeable? The second question is, are you agreeable to all or to only those you choose? Are you agreeable to some and argumentative towards others? Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. Let your gentleness be manifested to all. Let it be shown to all, not just your fan base, not just your supporters or those you rely upon. Manifest gentleness, manifest agreeableness to those who have insulted you, to those who have perhaps undervalued you. Manifest sweet reasonableness to those who oppose you. Manifest gentleness, forbearance to those who are persecuting you. If you want peace, God's peace, then be a peacemaker and a peacekeeper. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. A prescription for getting peace. Hide your life in Christ. Be agreeable, not argumentative. And a third thing I find, be prayerful and not fearful. Some of the most famous words in the New Testament, Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, present your request to God. How is it possible not to be anxious about anything? How is it possible not to be anxious 
when you need a job or a better job? How is it possible not to be anxious when your kids are headed down the wrong path? How is it possible not to be anxious when you've received a devastating diagnosis? Well, the only way not to be anxious about anything is to pray about everything. Paul says here, in everything, pray. Jesus taught the connection between fearlessness and prayer. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said three times, do not worry. Do not worry about your life. Do not worry about your practical needs. Do not worry about tomorrow. Do not worry, do not worry, do not worry. And then Jesus said, your father knows what you need before you even ask him. Now it's kind of funny. Paul says, make your request known to God. But Jesus said, whatever we make known to God, he already knows. If that's true, why should we pray at all? Well, it's because in the process of articulating our needs to him, we are casting our cares on him. And we're declaring our faith in him. You know, I always feel better after I pray. If I watch too much news and I'm stirred up, I feel better after I pray. After I go through the monthly bills, I feel better after I pray. <laughs> after I pray, I have peace. After I pray, I can think clearly. I can, I can concentrate. Somebody once said, you, you can't do more than pray before you pray. But after you pray, you can do anything. And I found it to be so true. Paul says, pray. Pray about everything. Have you ever wondered if something is too small to bring to the Lord? You know, it's a concern on your heart. It's causing you grief. You're feeling it. You're agonizing over it. But you wonder, oh, Lord, I know you're really busy up there running the universe, and, and this is so small. Somebody said something wonderful to me this week. It's so good. He said, is anything big to God? Really, everything we lift to him is small to him, isn't it? We have a need right now to finish the sanctuary. It's, it's urgent. We need some cash to finish up the building. There's, there's a gap between the amount of loan funding we have, between what we've raised so far and what we need to finish the building. And I have to tell you, in my heart, it's a big need. But what can we lift to the Lord that's big to him? Nothing is too hard for the Lord. And if everything we lift to him is small, that must mean there's nothing too small that we can lift to him. Amen? In everything, pray. How do we get God's peace? Hide your life in Christ. Be agreeable, not stubborn, and be prayerful, not fearful. And here's what Paul says, and the peace of God that passes understanding will guard your heart and your mind. That, 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 that word guard, it, it means to circle you like a fortress. Pray. Hide yourself in Christ. Be agreeable. And the peace of God will encircle your mind like a wall. It'll encircle your emotions like a wall. It'll encircle your decision-making process like a wall. The word is a garrison, a fortress. Pray and God will fortress you. A description of peace, a description for getting peace. And finally, let's talk quickly about a prescription for retaining peace. A prescription for retaining peace. Last night on Facebook, I, I posted the title of my sermon and one of my old friends popped up. I, I posted, I'm preaching about a prescription for peace. And he, he popped up and he said, make sure it comes with automatic refills. <laughs> so how do we get automatic refills on God's peace? Once we've obtained his peace, how do we maintain it? How do we hold on to it? Paul tells us in verse 8 and 9. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, whatever is lovely, admirable, if it's excellent, if it's praiseworthy, think on these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. And look what it says. And the peace of God will abide with you. Our girls that come to the Wednesday night Missionettes program memorize these verses. In fact, I have to tell you, these are verses that every one of us ought to commit to memory. 
We ought to print out Philippians 4, 8, and 9, and we ought to tape them on every television screen and every computer monitor. You should make it the background on your iPhone. You should make Philippians 4, 8, 9 your password before you log in. Why is there such a sharp increase in anxiety and depression? Why is one out of every six Americans on medication for anxiety or depression? It's because of our lousy diet. And I don't mean fast food, although that contributes. Specifically, I mean what we are feeding our minds and our emotions and our spirits. How do we maintain God's peace? First of all, stop eating junk food. Actually, we could flip Paul's words and we could state them negatively to help us know what not to do. Whatever is false, whatever is dishonorable, whatever is unjust, whatever is morally impure, whatever is ugly, bloody, gory, dark, evil, repulsive, whatever is despicable or lacking virtue, do not think on these things. I wonder how your favorite TV shows measure up to Paul's list. How does The Walking Dead measure up to Paul's list? Oh, now I'm getting up in your business. Yeah, I said it. How does Game of Thrones measure up to Paul's list? How do your movie choices measure up? How does your internet browsing measure up? Your reading choices, your music preferences. Listen to me, beloved. When you're repeating the lyrics of a song over and over again, you are meditating on those things. You know what the word meditate means in the Bible? It means literally to repeat something over and over, to repeat it out loud. It means to memorize something by repeating it over and over again out loud. And so what we're supposed to meditate in is the law of the Lord. What we're supposed to meditate in is the scripture. What we're supposed to memorize by repeating out loud over and over again is the truth of the word. When you repeat the lyrics to a song over and over again, boom, bada, boom, bada, boom, bada, boom, bada, and you repeat the lyrics over and over again, you are meditating those things. You are feeding your spirit the values that they embrace. I'm getting, I wasn't this bold in 830. I'm getting, I, uh, the caffeine must have gotten to my head. I'm, I'm getting bold. <laughs> See, you are what you eat is not only true of our physical bodies, but it's true of our inner person as well. If you feed on sexually impure junk food, your inner man will become tainted. If you feed on violent junk food, your inner man will become angry. You can have an angry spirit. If you feed on sarcasm and sardonic humor, your inner man will become cynical. If you feed on horror and gore, your inner man will become anxious and fearful. Years ago, we had a, an executive in our church, very successful young woman. If I told you the name of the national company she worked for, you would automatically know it. And she came for prayer one day because she was gripped by a terrible spirit of fear. She was actually babysitting. She was single at the time, and she was babysitting for some friends. And, and, and in the evening, she, she was so overcome and so gripped with a spirit of fear that, that she called the police to the house. This is, this is a competent, educated, professional, successful person. And as we sat down and started talking and unpacking a little bit, we found out that she was a huge fan of the vampire novels that were, were so hot at the time. You see, she was feeding her spirit darkness, and what she reaped was a spirit of fear. And the Lord set her free from it. How do we retain peace? Stop eating junk food and eat clean. Feed your spirit what is true, just, pure, noble, lovely, excellent. Obviously, the place to start is with the word of God. His word is truth. His word is pure. Listen, the Bible tells the very messy stories of real people's lives, and it tells it without sugarcoating it. It doesn't mince word, but it tells us God's view on the whole matter. But Paul's words don't limit us to what is explicitly Christian only. Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and excellent. One of the places that I love to find beauty is in God's creation. Another place I love to find beauty is in people 
celebrating what's good about them. I have a shelf next to my desk in my office, and I I have a bunch of pictures on it uh, of family and close friends, ministry friends of places that we've been and memories we've shared. And every so often, I just glance over them, and I just enjoy thinking about the people in my life I've grown to love and what's good about them. One of the things Denise has done for our kids ever since they were very small is she has read them great stories of real-life heroes. People who have changed history for better through their courage and through their faith. Stories of missionaries, stories of people of faith. I'm going to tell you, those stories are so much more inspiring than watching Superman beat the stuffing out of Batman. (laughs) How do we retain peace? Stop eating junk food, eat clean. And finally, worship team, you can help me. Keep practicing your faith. Keep practicing your faith. Paul closes these verses with one of my favorite words that he uses in the New Testament. He says, practice. I love that word. The things that you've seen and heard, the things that you've observed me do, you practice those things. I love the word practice because it means I'm not there yet, but I'm working on it. Practice means I haven't mastered it yet, but I'm growing. I'm not all the way, but I'm on the way. Practice means that God doesn't expect perfection out of me yet, but he's watching my progress and he's pleased. Practice means I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. I'm running. I'm pursuing Christ. I'm running towards the prize, the goal, and the prize of Christ. Practice. Practice what you've been taught. Practice what you've seen other successful believers do. Find a believer who's living a joyful, fruitful, blessed life. Find that person and copy what they do. Practice it. Practice rejoicing. Practice being gentle. Practice being agreeable. Sweet reasonableness. Practice praying about everything. Practice refraining from junk food. Practice eating clean. Practice, practice, practice. And here's the result. The peace of God that passes understanding. The unexplicable peace of God when you should be panicking. The inner calm, the inner confidence, the inner courage. The peace of God that encircles your emotions and your thinking and your decision making. Peace that endures will abide with you. So that's God's peace, a description of it, a prescription for getting it, and a prescription for retaining peace. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, a good praise in this place today?